You're listening to the Outdoors Group podcast. This podcast is a call to arms to get children and young people outside again. It's your one-stop shop for all things outdoor, child, young person and education related. Thanks for tuning in. We're absolutely delighted today to be joined by Alistair Whitby, Project Officer at the Ooze and Ada Rivers Trust. Ali's here to talk to us about a very unique project that he worked on from 2019 for three years. Called the Epic Project, along with other bodies, the Ooze and Ada Rivers Trust took on the huge task of rerouting a waterway called Broadwater, Broadwater Brook to halt ecological extinction, increase species resilience and improve water quality. We're really excited to have you here today, Alistair. So thanks for joining us. Oh, an absolute pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. Oh, no, you're welcome. And um, so I didn't want to give away too much in the introduction. So can you start by explaining what the problem with the brook was before you guys got involved? Yeah, unfortunately, you know, like a lot of rivers in this country, there were a lot of problems and this uh, little bit of waterway had a huge number. So uh, one of the main uh, problems was that it was culverted. So it was uh, for, for kind of large sections. It was in big concrete pipes that went under um, a town on the south coast called Worthing. Um, which is, you know, obviously a massive problem for ecology because there's not much life in a concrete pipe, uh, but it's also really not good for, for flooding. Um, there was a big chemical factory that used to be able to kind of pump its effluent straight into the stream. Obviously, that's not allowed to happen anymore, but uh, historically that, that was allowed to happen. And so there was a lot of, uh, yeah, historical kind of legacy pollution. Um there's a lot of road runoff actually that comes from a major dual carriageway called the A27 which runs to the north of Worthing. Uh, there was an industrial estate that had uh, runoff coming off the industrial estate and it also had a lot of agricultural runoff from, from farmland on the downs. So kind of all of that uh, combined um, meant that there was a very heavily degraded river with lots of contaminants, lots of runoff, high levels of sediment, a big kind of sludgy mess. In other words, a very, a very sad uh, little stream. Sad state of affairs. What was it like at the source? Yeah, so that was the that was the kind of the ray of hope. So the the, the source uh, was a, a downland chalk stream. Uh, I'm sure lots of your listeners will probably know that you know we we have uh, about 80 percent of the the chalk streams uh, in the world in in the south of the UK, and they are incredible uh, incredible bits of habitat when they're working well. Uh, and and this little bit of uh, chalk stream before it hit. Uh, all of those kind of negative inputs was actually looking pretty healthy. So we had about half a mile of of <laughs> relatively good uh, chalk stream that we were hoping to to kind of revive for the for the rest of the course of of the Broadwater Brook. Yeah. So the initial goal of the project, what did you hope to achieve? What was the, what was the aim? So yeah, so we had quite a few different aims. Uh, I mean, the principal one obviously was kind of daylighting the stream. So uh, bringing it up to the surface where it had been culverted, giving it a, a, a new route across some some farmland away from the industrial estate, away from uh, the landfill site that was near it, uh, away from the other inputs. Um, but also really around um, kind of flood resilience. So um, making sure that uh, rather than a, a very kind of uh, a small channel that we had plenty of kind of marginal shelves where, you know, in high water events, high rainfall events, um, you know, the water could actually go somewhere that, that didn't create any damage. Um, and so we, we deliberately kind of were had in mind to kind of build in lots of kind of marginal wetland areas uh, so that you know in this in the summer when we had relatively low flows it could be in a low flow channel but in the autumn winter spring whenever we got kind of big rains it, it would be able to kind of spread into the surrounding landscape um so that was kind of like from a from an ecology perspective but we also very much wanted to to try and um make sure that the local population had a kind of connection to the stream because um a lot of the local people didn't really even know if it existed or certainly if it did exist, they didn't know where it flowed because mm -hmm. there was no access to the farmland. So we were very keen to put in kind of new permissive footpaths just so people actually had a connection to uh, the, 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 the local waterway that, that they could see on kind of place names, um, yeah. but didn't have a connection to. And then the, the, the last piece of the puzzle was, you know, the creation of lots of other um, uh, wildlife habitat, so new wildlife ponds, areas of woodland and scrub, um, big areas of wildflower meadow, 
uh, lots of new wetlands. So kind of a real mosaic of, of, of different habitats to try and you know, help reverse some of the biodiversity losses that we, we hear so much about. Yeah, well, that's amazing. Quite a big, complex project then. <laughs> For sure, yeah. Were you quite excited when you got given this project or was it a bit overwhelming at first? Uh, I have to say, yeah, it was fairly daunting. Uh, I, I actually got hired to to do this, to kind of like fulfil this project after um, one of the other, one of my colleagues, Peter King, had had actually kind of uh, written up and, and got the funding for it. So I kind of came on to to deliver it and, you know, reading through you know a, a couple of inches of paperwork <laughs> about what what we were planning to do was 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 pretty daunting but it was also really exciting because there was yeah. so much scope for uh benefit not just to the the local wildlife and habitats but also to the local community loads of ways for them to connect to to the landscape so yeah no super exciting as well exciting to be able to be part of bringing that kind of people and planet back together massively yeah so it was half a mile at the beginning that was healthy. So how long was the bit that then got planned off, if that makes sense, until it reached? Yeah, the, reached so it was, it, it, was an, it was another kind of kilometre and a bit um, of of new channel um, and then all of the kind of surrounding habitat um, around that. So, you know, uh, about seven hectares of, of wildflower meadow and, and, you know, lots of other kind of marginal uh, a habitat so it was about like brand new uh, um, channel was about a kilometre and a bit. Okay and then did it join another river or? Yeah so it kind of rejoined um, part of its uh, kind of an old uh, pathway um, mm. uh, so it, yeah it kind of it got diverted away from the, the worst of the, the the inputs and then rejoined um, uh, another bit of waterway and was actually then joined by another bit of um, flushed fen uh, waterway which um, then kind of headed down to a lake called Brooklands Lake um, which had you know actually has had lots of work done uh, on, on it itself uh, to kind of increase uh, its ecology um, so yeah it was really good to be able to actually provide a new kind of source of of clean uh, water to, to, to Brooklands Lake. Yeah that's amazing and um, so rerouting a river's a pretty massive task um and obviously not something that i'm guessing is done particularly regularly so um i'm guessing you had lots of collaboration with experts so who else is involved in the project as, as well as the trust yeah i mean absolutely it was a, it was a kind of a team effort but actually in the river restoration sector it's more common than you might imagine to, okay. to, to reroute rivers um i mean almost all of the rivers in in this country have been heavily modified in the past often you know straightened and narrowed and dredged and and given very steep sides um you know and obviously the thinking was that it would carry away water very swiftly and solve local flooding problems um but and you know this was done for hundreds of years um until we realized that that just kind of shunts the problem downstream um is is actually really terrible for flooding and it's very mm -hmm. Uh, detrimental for wildlife and habitats obviously mm. um you know a wiggled a, a wiggled stream holds a huge amount more water than a, a straightened stream even if it's yeah. been dredged uh, it just it kind of you know just the capacity of, of that shape uh ho holds a huge amount more so yeah. um yeah th there are lots of uh river trusts around the the country that are reversing some of that work you know adding gravels back which are really important for fish obviously when you dredge a stream you take a lot of the the habitat in stream out including the gravels where fish lay their eggs and um you know uh, the freshwater invertebrates live in in the gravel so kind of re-wiggling rivers increasing that habitat increasing flood resilience is something that a lot of river river trusts are doing and amazingly often you can actually find the old courses of the streams if you look at um ordnance survey maps or old maps or even if in a in a dry summer you you just look at where there are green bits in the field compared to the, the surrounding areas which are, are totally parched you can often actually find these old riverbeds and then you can scrape out the 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 kind of the sludge and the mud that's on top of that and often you can actually find the original kind of river gravels uh, and i've visited some amazing river restoration projects uh, around the country uh, including in the new forest where they actually found the old gravels and now you know only a couple of years on you wouldn't know that 
the river hadn't been going down its old lonely wiggly route for forever because it just it, it, it cleans the gravels as the mm. first rains that come um but yeah absolutely in terms of collaboration it was a it was a big kind of collaborative experience between um the environment agency they they had tried to to think about how they could actually do this work but uh, a big agency like the environment agency obviously the, the kind of sums of money that they uh, were talking about it was just much more expensive than for a quite a nimble small uh, rivers trust to actually execute so they passed on the the work to us um, and obviously you need specialist uh, river builders uh, to actually dig the new channel it's, it's a very uh, challenging thing to do particularly I'll talk a little bit later about some of the challenges we face but um, you do need specialist river builders you can't just get you know any old digger driver to, to dig a new river channel um, so we worked with Salix who are specialist river builders and uh, lots of other partners to actually deliver it but you know the, the something estate trust who are the landowner uh, were obviously absolutely key as well you know having landowners who um, look favorably on this kind of project and actually encourage it and want to create kind of new bits of habitat is, is really really important so a big big shout out to them as well yeah that was going to be one of my questions actually which I think I forgot to write about which was where did the land come from so it was something something estate. something estate trust yeah so they they own um three farms um that go from the kind of coastal plain up onto the the south downs which are kind of chalk downs and then over to the north of the downs so quite a, a, a decent size of, of land and you know they they have been really great at, at doing lots of um, uh, habitat improvement work all over their farm so it was really mm -hmm. good to work with them. Because not only were they letting you guys reroute the river there but you were talking about the permissive path so they're also letting people yeah. on the land that hadn't previously had absolutely access. Mm. Yeah, which is really key. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. So, yeah, you just mentioned challenges. What are some of the biggest challenges that you faced with the project? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, as you can imagine, with a big project like this, lots and lots of challenges <laughs> as well. Um, I mean, it's one of the the last bits of, of kind of green gap uh, along this stretch of the coastal plain. So uh, a lot of the kind of utility cables, the pipes and the, the electric cables uh, went through that land. So, you know, for example, we had the main east west uh, sewage pipe that had been uh, kind of uh, buried through through that land. So we actually had to lower the, the main sewage pipe underneath the the bed of the new stream oh, wow. which okay. was a huge bit of engineering as you can imagine so we had yeah. to create a new section of pipe um and then you know uh, when they weren't actually kind of pushing sewage through it which you know there, it, 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 i kind of started learning lots about you know how <laughs> sewage moves through the system mm -hmm. and the, the, there was a period where we could actually disconnect the old pipe reconnect the new section yeah. um and and not interrupt the flow of of sewage through yeah. the land so it was really it was really fascinating um but yeah so that had to happen um there was also a lot of archaeology and i'll i'll talk a little bit about archaeology later i think um but you know finding lots of archaeology obviously that can put a halt to lots of projects luckily we we did find a lot of archaeology, but we were working very closely with the Worthing Archaeological Society and, and actually it became a wonderful part of the project. Mm. Um, uh, the Rampian offshore wind farm cable, the main kind of high voltage uh, power cable running south to north went through this land. Uh, and then also just it, there was very little gradient on the site. So I've talked a little bit about the Chalk Hills. They're just to the to the north of the project land um, but the rest of the land uh, that, that we were actually doing the project on was very flat um, there was even a slight hill that we needed to get the water to go over to, to pass through the new channel so we had to basically make a very kind of wide valley uh, through the, the middle section of the new bit of channel um, to, just to be able to, to, to get the water to flow yeah. from from kind of north to south and down to down to the sea. And that's why you have those specialist river builders in. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So what kind of considerations are there for the, the actual builders? Is it to do with like the, the slope like you were saying about people? Yeah, so that's that's feet? definitely one of them. Uh, obviously, when you when you've got a, you know, a 25 ton digger and you've got a giant digger bucket, um, uh, you you you, ha you have to be incredibly precise uh, you know you're just taking off kind of one or two mils so you're you're digging the channel but then mm. it has to be accurate to, to within kind of millimeters um, yeah. so you have to have you know 
a person standing uh, doing the kind of the, the, the measurements as as the dig is is happening um you have to just make sure that kind of from a from a kind of morphological perspective from a, a kind of a river perspective that it's all of the habitats fit well together and and the, the you know the water is actually going to do what you intend it to do so it's all got to be uh sketched out and planned uh, incredibly precisely uh, before any diggers actually get to site and it's got to be kind of signed off um, and then you've got to have somebody who can actually uh, build it to that plan uh, yeah. with incredible accuracy uh, so that's you know that's the, the the kind of the challenge that you face. Yeah I hadn't even thought about that if it's literally millimeters with those yeah those massive diggers trying to yeah tiny tiny bit off must be uh, yeah yeah they must be very good at what they do. <laughs> they really are yeah and they're all they've all got kind of gps in their cabs and you know their uh, everything is, is 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 you know all of their equipment is is kind of uh, uh to kind of tagged geo tagged and everything like that so you, they can kind of see where they are on the plan and, and how they're doing it as yeah. they're doing it but still it, it you know it requires a lot of skill to be able to actually execute that yeah to do that yeah amazing um, so what was the public reaction to what you guys were undertaking? Were people mostly supportive and like, yeah, did the community get involved in the actual process of it? Mm, very much so. Yeah, I mean, a, a, a massive highlight of of the the project as a whole was the the incredible uh, response that we had from the local community. Um, we had a huge amount of events over the course of two and a half years. I think over 300 uh, separate events that we did. Fundraising um, for awareness. Yeah, so I, I mean, just everything you can imagine. Uh, we, we did water quality testing, you know, wetland plug planting, bio blitzes, you know, creating high vernacular for reptiles, bug hotels, bee hotels, you know, yeah. bird box making workshops, uh, so many different surveys. Um, huge amounts of tree planting. We we planted 8,000 uh, native trees across the site. Um, so you know, just a, a massive, a massive amount of work, and and over 1,700 people from the local community uh, took part in one of those um, events, uh, which was incredible. So you know, massively supportive, and and yeah. that was one of the the reasons that we could actually do this project uh, rather than um uh you know the environment agency doing it it was a, a national lottery heritage funded project um and it, it it needed the people it needed the kind of the 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 heritage aspects to be kind of fully woven into the project otherwise it, it just wouldn't have uh happened uh, so we had a lot of kind of just for fun activities as well yeah. that also were kind of exploring the heritage you know a painting by the river and sculpture and and we had a, a, a really fun wildlife photography course for uh families and teens and that so cool. you know it was 12 12 sessions from a, yeah. a kind of an introduction right through to an amazing exhibition of all the photos on worthing pier uh over the course of the whole building process and then the 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 kind of the habitat uh kind of taking over the site so you know there were lots and lots of activities that people could get involved in and and that really kind of made the project what it was it, it really wouldn't have been this, the same kind of project if it didn't have that kind of yeah. absolutely hands-on um uh kind of element from from the local community and so many different aspects of the local community as well lots of schools got involved uh, uh, lots of you know schools. yeah local men in sheds groups you know helping and you know, huge amounts of we had a, a really nice um uh a group called age concern that were were, were doing uh um, a kind of uh another aspect of the project so yeah it was um it was great i mean obviously with any with any project like this um any any, any big changes happening in the local community you'll have um, some scepticism and you know we did have some scepticism from some aspects of the community at what first about the kind of motivations surely they can't just be doing this for the creation of some river habitat um, and obviously the, there was some disruption um, from uh, all of the kind of the diggers and equipment mm -hmm. coming across the land and that kind of stuff so uh, particularly during the actual initial dig the, the, there was a little bit of uh, um, you know understandable um, objection but once people saw the site and also they as you say they, they get access to the site um, uh, then I think all of those qualms kind of went away pretty quickly because people were able to to see the, the the new habitats. They saw that there was a wonderful river that was right on their doorstep, and they've really fully embraced it. 
That's awesome. Yeah, so yeah, you just mentioned that I was gonna say as well as the community being involved in the process. Now they've obviously got that space to roam and walk along the river that they didn't have before. So that's incredible, isn't it? Um Definitely. Yeah, I mean and the site is is predominantly now used by locals. Um, you know, you see a lot of uh school groups going down there, a lot of dog walkers, uh, a lot of people make it into their their like local jogging route. Um, you know, we've received so much amazing feedback about how um yeah that th they just didn't even they, they'd never even though they'd lived in something which is the local village for their whole lives they'd never actually seen the downs from that perspective because they yeah. never had access to that land so just being able to to give people uh that access and actually to kind of claim that heritage for themselves it really does feel like because so many people have been involved in actually creating that habitat that it, it feels like it's their it's their space more than anybody's yeah, uh, which is exactly yeah. what we were hoping would happen uh, and there's a huge amount of ownership in the local community to that space um yeah there was a lot of really great upskilling as well of local people we did a lot of things like hedge laying courses so you know a lot of people now have skills whether they be photography skills or you know um countryside management skills that they didn't have before um and a lot of people are actually continuing to regularly maintain the site because obviously when you've created a huge amount of habitat like we did you can't just kind of like leave it and do nothing um so we have regular monthly river ranger sessions where people go down there and we seasonally uh do kind of reed cutting and uh hedge maintenance and we've created a lovely living uh willow hide for bird spotting that obviously needs maintenance and and mm. reweaving and things like that every year so there's there's loads and loads of monthly activities uh including cleaning all the interpretation boards and making sure we've, we've got lots of nice picnic tables and things like that making sure that everything is um as it should be that's amazing it sounds like you've really enriched that kind of local community like what a gift for them and great that they've taken ownership of it and yeah that's yeah awesome. absolutely i mean that's that's the thing that uh, kind of i think is really deeply satisfying from from our side is is quite how how much it has in, enriched that local community and how how many people i think have you know essentially you know i'm sure they were ecologically aware beforehand but are so much more ecologically aware now that they've done all of that surveying work and they kind of they know intimately about you know the invertebrates in the river or or the the harvest mice uh in in the hedgerows and that kind of stuff it really is uh quite quite magical yeah and uh you're saying about the schools as well i guess the access for schools to come and do some of their learning on site there now is sure. there yeah and we've yeah. still got school groups coming down there quite regularly. Um, yeah, uh, there's one school that does its kind of John Muir Award uh, um, activities down there. And I That's do kind of regular uh, school tours uh, mm. down on the site. So it has become a kind of a real feature uh, for, for yeah the local population, which is wonderful. Ah, excellent. So I was about to ask about how quickly did it take to see the benefits of what you're doing? So we've obviously just talked about the community benefits, but in terms of... Uh, like habitat and the water itself and things like that mm. how how quickly do you see new life kind of coming into this new stretch yeah i mean that that was also just mind-bendingly exciting because it was incredibly quick uh i mean there's a saying that's used in ecology quite a lot build it and they will come and that was certainly <laughs> uh you know our experience uh yeah. in spades you know new species started arriving almost as the, the 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 diggers were still on site uh, i mean you just saw dragonfly species zipping up and down the the new waterways uh even before it had been re you know connected to the new river channel because there was groundwater coming up and sitting uh in in the 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 new kind of the new channel and some of the new ponds that were had been built uh so they were just egg laying straight into these new new bits of water and it was incredible to see so yeah, yeah certainly new species started arriving straight away uh, and the whole place started to green up you know when you've got sunlight and water you get life in abundance yeah. and uh you know as soon as the ponds filled with water and the wildlife meadows started to spring to life after we'd reseeded them with you know native mix of of beautiful wildflower seeds mm -hmm. um and we also did something called hydro seeding of the banks which is is a kind of a mix of um hay uh, and seed so it kind of it's mixed into a kind of a bit of a wet pulp and you kind of spray it onto the banks and that's because when you've got a very uh, kind of newly cut bank which is quite a hard, kind of harsh uh, 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 
environment uh it, it's quite difficult for very small seeds to get find find a, a niche for for the, the their roots to get into but if you hydro seed it creates enough of a uh, a kind of binding agent um of that hay to actually germinate the seeds for long enough so it stays wet for long enough and then the seeds can start to find their way into the bank so hydro seeding was 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 fantastically um positive in, in terms yeah. of just allowing those banks then to spring to life quite quickly um but yeah in, in terms of other benefits i mean we we saw the the kind of the biology in the fresh water uh w was kind of almost immediately improved so um, there's something called biological water quality monitoring the bmwp surveying that happens uh in uh, a lot of waterways around the country and it's a score that basically uh, tells you how much life and the kind of diversity of that life. So we had 29 species before the work uh, started, and there are over 75 species of, of freshwater invertebrate uh, now, including lots of water beetles and, you know, species that indicate a really quite improved water quality, such yeah. as, you know, case caddis and mayfly and things like that, that, that don't tolerate pollution very well. Mm -hmm. So if, if you've got those species in there, you know that the water quality is is pretty amazing um great, so yeah. it was it was great to see that that's amazing and then um, do you have you um i was gonna say have you been regularly testing to keep an eye on things uh, definitely yeah so we we do kind of monthly testing of that the, the biological the bmwp serving uh serving but also we do a lot of chemical testing so actually testing for nitrates and and phosphates mm. in uh the water itself um, and uh, that's been really improving uh, as well. One of the things that we included in the design of the river was um, silt traps, um, which are basically the, the river's coming along and it, it moves into a much wider section of channel. And that allows all of the, um, the, the kind of the sediment particles in the water, which are often kind of binding with some of the pollution uh, to drop out. Uh, so when you've got kind of relatively fast water coming along and then it goes into a section of quite still water, mm. all of that ha sediment has the, the the capacity to drop out and that massively then cleans the water. Okay. Um, so that alongside having loads and loads, I mean, like thousands and thousands of new wetland plants that this water yeah. is moving through. And obviously the the nitrates and the phosphates are actually kind of food for those wetland plants. So yeah. it's kind of pollution in the water environment but you know uh, that's also what the plants feed on so they are sucking uh, you know that that pollution out of the water um so the the, the combination of the silt traps and the new wetland system had yeah. an incredible uh impact on on the cleanliness of the water and we can see we test at four points kind of the mouth of the channel you know two points in the middle and then at the very uh, end of the channel as it's going out into to, to the to the str the rest of the stream yeah um and you can see just from the top to the bottom that you know it's halving in nitrates and halving in phosphates just over the course of that new one kilometer section uh which, which is just amazing again yeah that's awesome isn't it phenomenal and you talked about the tree planting is that to do with um helping to maintain the banks of the new stretch yeah to a certain extent so we we planted uh, another really rare species called black poplar which is you know vanishingly rare in the landscape um, mm. and and willow uh, and, and other kind of plants like alder that like having their feet wet so we planted them along the banks to size the banks Okay. the tree planting was um, new hedge lines so you know hedges are incredibly important um, for all kinds of reasons, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're brilliant habitat for small mammals and for uh, all kinds of invertebrates, uh, land-based invertebrates. Uh, birds obviously use them, lots of different species use them, but also species like bats use them to actually move through the landscape. So they use linear features to move through the landscape. And uh, so it's really important to make sure that if you're creating new bits of habitat, that you're actually connecting those habitats up with other bits of habitat so yeah. that you know hedgehogs and bats and all forms of other uh, uh life can actually use them to get from one bit of habitat to another so 
yeah, the trees were were massively important just to kind of delineate the edges of the new pathways and things like that, because we we had a, a completely new uh, permissive footpath uh, that was coming onto the land and then walking alongside the stream and then ending up at a, a nice picnic spot. We needed to kind of delineate the edge of that uh, and the edges of the, the wildflower meadows also. Um, so most of the trees went into the hedge rows, but we also created new pockets of of what are called shore woodland so little little patches of woodland with you know 80 trees in them uh, mm. which again are really uh, fantastically uh, good for biodiversity oh amazing just it just sounds like this project has encompassed so much <laughs> over the time so um it was three years was it from start to yeah I mean, official finish what yeah. was, I mean this must be a might be a hard question but any like standout moments anything that you particularly think oh like that was an amazing day or you know an amazing bit of news from the time yeah I mean there's there's lots of different things uh I mean one of the highlights is is that we had some species that were uh non-existent in Sussex um and they turned up in at, really? in our little bit of uh wetland so we had the scarce blue-tailed damselfly which uh, was the first time that it was recorded in in Sussex for 120 years, um, and it was an amazing discovery in and of itself. But you know, we then found out over successive summers that there was actually a huge breeding population. So, one of the things you can do with scarce blue-tailed damselflies is you can kind of take a photo of uh, the the tail end pattern. Uh, at, at the end of their body, and you can actually identify them individually. So we were able to identify 60 different males that were on this stretch of the Broadwater Burke. And we had a, an amazing guy called Dave Sadler who who kind of made it his uh, life's work to photograph these these um, damselflies and amazing. and do a whole study on them and and actually observe new behaviour in them and things like that. So, but it was amazing getting species like that turn up. We just hadn't been in Sussex for for a long time, and there were a number of different uh, leaf hoppers and uh, uh, mining bees and things like that that were either the first or the second or the third time it had been uh, recorded, uh, not just in Sussex but sometimes the whole country because we're right on the south coast uh, of the UK as well. So any kind of migrating uh, species coming from continent, continental Europe, this is often one of the very first places they will hit on the south coast so yeah that was just really amazing but um yeah bird species going from kind of 45 species uh, at the start of the project to so over 80 uh, at the end of the project and and we had some pretty rare ones you know peregrine falcons and kingfishers and wow. grasshopper warblers and bearded tits and ravens and we were even visited um by one of the the white-tailed seagulls that uh, um, have been released uh, on the Isle of Wight. So just huge amounts of diversity coming to the site um, and, you know, it just being very, very exciting. Um, yeah, I think those are probably the, the highlights, just seeing seeing kind of the, the benefits and, and, you know, nature really coming back in, in, in great abundance. That's amazing. The falcon's pretty cool as well. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> no, that's amazing. Um, so for your trust, is there another big project in the pipeline? Because obviously that's that was took over your life for three years. So uh, is there anything next, or are you on smaller projects now? Yeah, I mean, there's there's obviously so much to do uh, in terms of helping our waterways. Um, it's been a lot in the news obviously recently about all the sewage problems so there's so much more to do we are we do a lot of other stuff as well as creating uh wetlands is a, a massive uh program around you know uh, removing non-native species you know things like himalayan balsam which are really uh kind of bad for our waterways as well um and plastic pollution so <clears throat> i've just uh finished the six months uh, projects removing uh, plastic pollution from the ooze and the ADA uh, as well doing lots of uh, local litter picks and auditing mm. all of the litter trying to find out where it's coming from uh, but yes there's, there's lots of new exciting projects on the horizon we've just uh, just literally uh, about a week ago finished uh, another re-wiggling uh, project just south of Lewis <laughs> in Sussex and there's yeah. you know plenty more uh, projects on the horizon I think we've got about 16 different projects that we're kind of either just about to start or in the middle of at the moment so 
yeah loads more to do but you know th there is so much to do in terms yeah. of helping our waterways so mm. but yeah hu huge huge amount to do oh that's really exciting so if people want to know what's going on in their area th there's rivers trust you said all over the country didn't you absolutely yeah just get get in touch with your local rivers trust um you know they always need volunteers they always need kind of specialist help as well so if you've got a particular area of expertise it's always very uh very in demand uh and uh yeah just the, i think that from a kind of well-being perspective there's very little that you can do that is of more benefit than uh being in these kind of blue green spaces i think there's mm -hmm. been several studies that have shown that you know the the, the well-being uh element of of particularly being in, in kind of wet spaces uh, is incredibly beneficial yeah. so it also has huge benefits for for anybody else getting in, getting involved as well yeah brilliant awesome and um, thank you so much for your time today is there anything else you wanted to tell us about the project that you don't think we have that we've covered most of it i think probably covered most of it yeah yeah Actually, just quickly tell me what epic stands for uh enhancing places inspiring communities Ah, brilliant. Which also kind of, yeah, that sums up, doesn't it, what you were talking about with the community and the nature. Just perfect. Yeah, for sure. Um, so just before I let you go, I've been asking everyone these three questions because it's a nice way to finish. Um, so my first question for you is how do you relax? Yeah, I do a lot of um, I do a lot of walking. Um, I'm really lucky in the sense that I live quite close to the South Downs in a place called Hassock. So um, there's lots of lovely downland walks. It's pretty close to the sea as well. And lots of river estuaries. Um, the U's and the Ada obviously are either side of me, but um, Cookmere Haven and lots of other places, you know, locally that are um, beautiful. Uh, West Sussex is also the kind of second most wooded county in the in the UK. And so there's lots of ancient woodlands around here. So I, I spend a lot of time uh, do, kind of doing walks, basically. I try yeah. to do yoga most mornings. Sometimes that definitely doesn't uh, work <laughs> during the summer holidays. That's completely gone to, to bits <laughs> with the kids being around. But um, yeah, uh, rock climbing, kind of bouldering. Um, I also dug a pond during lockdown, which I think is the best thing I've, I've ever done in my life. So I couldn't recommend that <laughs> more highly. If anybody has a spare little bit of uh, area in their garden, do mm. dig a pond because it's like the, the best entertainment. Y every day there's something different happening in your pond. It, it's pond. just it, it's much better than TV. <laughs> Excellent. And um, what are you reading or listening to right now? So that could be books, music, podcasts, anything. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. I'm. I'm always. I'm one of these people that's always in the middle of about five books. So I've. Uh, I've just finished uh, Wild Fell uh, by Lee Schofield. It's about rewilding the uplands in the Lake District, and it's you know utterly inspiring. Very beautifully written. Mm -hmm. Really recommend that. Um, I'm at, in the middle of uh, a book called A Small Farm Future, which is by a guy called uh, Chris Mage, which is all about, you know, how sustainable small scale farms could be the solution to, you know, biodiversity, climate, economic crisis that we're, we're facing. And um, just on the river side, uh, I'm also reading a book uh, called The Flow by Amy Jane Beer. And uh, it's kind of about the the kind of the magic and the power of our kind of watery places the rivers and lakes and streams and becks in the UK so you know if, if anybody wants to kind of delve into uh rivers and wetlands more that's a great place to start introduction excellent yeah and um finally why is being outdoors important to you um I think the main thing is it, it brings me kind of peace it's my my happy place um I've got two kids as well and I see that it's it's so important for them and their future uh my 12 year old son came back the other day uh and he was just in a foul mood and he actually suggested going out uh himself ra r rather than me and it's usually me saying hey why don't you go to the forest I'm sure you'll feel much better after you go to the forest but he went out and after two hours uh he came back with his sister and they had been getting on really well and they'd just been having an amazing time you know mm. chasing crickets and and you know running around in the fields and he actually came up with this phrase green time not screen time to try and remind <laughs> himself uh that if he's ever in a mood if he's ever feeling bad or low or whatever green time not screen time and you know I just found that so beautiful and it, it's just true it's a, it's a kind of a bomb for the soul uh for all of us uh and yeah. not least our little people
Yeah, amazing. Brilliant. Thanks so much for your time today. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. Enjoy chatting to you. Great stuff. Thank you, Hannah. Cheers. A big thank you again to Alistair from the Ooze and Ada Rivers Trust for coming to talk to us about this amazing project that they've done. We really enjoyed talking to him and hope that you enjoyed listening and maybe you've been inspired to find out what community work is going on in the natural spaces around you. Um, If you enjoyed the episode, as always, we would love it if you would rate the podcast, subscribe, tell all your friends about it just so that more people can find us. We'll be back in a fortnight with another episode and until then, thanks for listening.